Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me, and thanks for the for the organization. Um, let me tell you a bit. Um, I, I'll be talking about um, using MyPy specifically uh, for type checking Shango Shango projects. Um, my name is uh, Daniel Moise. Um, I've been working with Python for some time, and I'm a minor contributor to MyPy. I'm working at Machinalis. We build, uh, we're a software engineering company building machine learning solutions, and we use Shango a lot to, to get those things to, to production. And we, we are using a bit of MyPy, and my goals here are um, this talk is not going to be a tutorial. It's not too technical. It has a few minor code examples, more to prove a point. I'm not expecting you to come out from this talk being able to use everything. It's, anyway, it's, it's quite easy. Uh, my goals here are to remove some important misconceptions. This is a topic, static typing is a topic which everybody has some strong opinion about. So I'm trying to tell you why to do it, which is the current state and maturity of the things, and what are the possible problems that, that you may find. Uh, most of the talk is, is actually generic to Python. The last part is a bit uh, focused on, on Shango. So given that, uh, uh, static typing is a bit complicated. So let me start with a simpler story. Uh, you're, we are going on holidays. Um, and then uh, we get to the airport, and the flight is delayed. And then we get to our destination, and they lost our luggage. And we have very bad weather. And so we go to a restaurant, and we get food poisoning. And after all that, my conclusion about that is that, OK, going on vacation is very, very bad. Uh, and actually, I may have had bad luck or chosen a bad airline or, or destination. Going on vacation by itself may not be bad. But this is something that happens a lot about around static typing, because um, many people have had some experiences with static typing on specific languages that come with a lot of other things along static typing, which are not uh, a requirement for static typing. And those bad experiences translate into a feeling that static typing is, is boring, is bad, is wearing a, a corset that doesn't allow you to do fun things, and et cetera, et cetera. So in the same sense that uh, Python is an OOP language, but very different to some OOP languages, and the garbage collection in Python is very different, and even loops in Python may be very different to other languages, I, I want to show you that uh, when you're doing static, Python, uh, static typing in Python, uh, the feeling is also quite different. An important misconception here is um, what, what are types? We use this word a lot, and it actually has a few, a few different meanings, and we tend to mix them up to each other, and, and there are actually subtle but, but important differences. Uh, one, one important thing is that um, we, may, we may use the word type to talk about data structure, the structuring thing, even the, the, the layout of some object in memory, and we may use the word type to refer to that. But in more theoretical context, uh, typing is used as a label with a given semantic over some syntactic, syntactic piece of your source code as a variable, a function, a, or, or some definition. Uh, there, there are even more meanings, but I, I want to talk about these two. Uh, generally, especially in, in the existing Python vocabulary, when you talk about type, type is even a runtime object that you can see and touch and, and change and, and point to it, uh, referring mostly to the first part of things, especially what, what kind of operations or functions are, are inside the type and what operations are allowed on objects really, uh, connected to, to that type. But in the static typing context, we normally want to talk about the second meaning, this uh, metadata and label that we attach to, to some piece of the, of the source code. 
other important misconceptions that are, are going around is that um, static typing does not mean that you have to declare the types of everything um, everywhere. That's called explicit typing. Uh, static typing is not necessarily a requirement to have a program running. In other languages, you actually have to convince the type checker that everything is fine be before being able to not even run, to compile your program and then being able to run it. And we are used to, in Python, to be able to run a program that we know is failing, we know has some problems, but we want to debug it, we are in the development process, and, and that's part of the fun part on Python. And, and there's no need to lose that. And lastly, uh, static typing is not something that has to be mandatory in the whole call. It's not just something that you choose for my whole project or for nothing. Uh, there are intermediate approaches, and, and that's what we are going to see in Python. So as a short story, uh, MyPy is a static type checker. That means this is a tool, uh, something, a program that you install and you're able to run. And you, what you do is you install this, you add some type annotations on the code, wherever uh, you want and wherever it's useful. Some of the, the type information is even inferred by MyPy, so it's, it's not required to do it everywhere. MyPy can guess most of the simple cases and where it's not relevant to add an explicit annotation. And then you run this on your source code, and you get some warning messages uh, telling that this annotation express uh, some kind of semantics, but your source code doesn't uh, has an inconsistency with that annotation, so either the annotation or the, or the source code is, is wrong. So as a very simple thing, uh, you have a very small program like that, like on a bomb. The annotations are the things underlined and in, and in light blue. And you can see that I made a, a, simple, a simple mistake. Then I can write, run MyPy on, on my code and get an error message. Know that running, uh, running this does not execute my code. Actually, executing this in Python does not give an error because the function is not being called. Uh, but doing this just analyzes the source code without executing it and gives me some, some information. Most, most of, the, of the people in, in other contexts and other languages talking about uh, static typing uh, promote this or, or comment on this as a form of uh, finding bugs or detecting errors um, in a program. And, and, and it's, it's tempting to think that because, well, you're, you're running MyPy and, and it produces a list of error messages, so it, oh, it's a tool to detect errors, right? And actually, this, this may be useful in some cases. Um, Python is very lazy about finding type errors because it doesn't report an error until you actually execute the line with that type error. It, it detects it on runtime. Um, but in general, in Python, e even if you have type errors, uh, if, if you're able to run that line, the error or, and the cause of it is quite obvious, so you aren't adding that much. And, well, you need to be able to run every line of your code, but if you have good tests, that shouldn't be a problem, and you should have good tests. So, in any case, uh, having, having this, the ability of, of detecting errors, uh, it's not an, the most important thing of, of type checking, uh, but it's actually, having used it, uh, quite valuable on development type, while we are just quickly de developing. And if you have this, for example, integrated into your editor, as, a, as the same way as a linter tool can help you detect some silly things like a type and a variable name or something like that, that kind of help may be a bit useful. But, let's um, this. Uh, there are other reasons that uh, you may be looking for in the, in the direction in, of type checking. And another thing that many people uh, wonder about this, this kind of thing is, okay, I can get some performance because compile languages where you specify all types are really, really fast. And, and that's, it's true that if you know uh, the structure in memory of some variables, you may use some more efficient implementations but that's closer to the type as representation meaning that I mentioned before. And 
it would be, in theory, possible to use the kind of annotations that are being used in Python for these kind of things. But uh, the people working on this uh, are not actually pushing into this direction. And, and I, I haven't heard about anybody which is actually doing this. So uh, if, you're inter if you're interested in this, you may need to do all the work by, by yourself. Um, and, and the way things are being done with MyPy right now um, and PEP 484, uh, not necessarily helping to this because you say, OK, this is an int, and, and you say, OK, I, I can use an efficient uh, machine representation for an integer. But actually saying an int may mean that you're using an, uh, a class that inherits int and adds logging everywhere to map all arithmetic operations to analyze efficiency of an algorithm. This is not a made-up example. Um, so the main reason the main reason, in my opinion, and I think it's, it's the main reason in the opinion of the people building MyPy, is that readability counts, as the Sen of Python says. And what you have is annotations specifying the author intent. And that adds to the readability of the software. Tom Christie was speaking uh, yesterday about uh, making, um, making the code more meaningful and using annotations of that. And, and it's that. It's not, it's not actually making the code meaningful because your code has already meaning, but making that meaning explicit. So it's, in some way, you can say it's like a doctrine, but the difference with the doctrine is that you can check this and verify that what you annotated explicitly actually match, matches the code, which can be a problem with doctrines. I, I, I've actually seen this uh, while adding type annotations for code that have types annotated in the doctrines that I, I found a lot of doctrines that were stale or a bit outdated. And having this kind of information is actually very useful while reading or getting into an existing piece of code and when refactoring the piece of code to understand how parts connect to each other and, and what the interfaces uh, are between different parts of the code. So uh, actually, uh, when I started working at MyPy, I, I did a small experience annotating some existing pieces of open source code that I hadn't, I hadn't written. Um, and I actually find that it's pretty useful to uh, grab a piece of code and try to annotate it, and you start to discover a lot of subtle things. And, and it, it's a very good way to start reading a piece of code that you don't know about. So uh, that's, that's something that I didn't expect. It. But well, doing annotation is like explaining the code to somebody else, and it, Explaining things always is a way to, to learn stuff. But also what you are annotating can be checked and verified to make sure that your assumptions are right. So another reason to, to do this is uh, to improve tool integration. Uh, some IDEs like PyCharm can use this kind of annotations to auto-completion to go to, for a go-to-definition function that's more accurate and, and precise for automatic refactoring. Um, documentation generations. I, I mentioned performance before. Um, there may even be other, other different things like, uh, well, again, the Tom Grissick's example yesterday, like generating an API or an interface or, or a serializer based on, on this kind of rich annotations and rich metadata about author intent. One important thing about, about MyPy and, and static py typing in Python is that it uses something which is known as gradual typing, which means you can start from, a, from an existing code base that has no annotations at all, add a few of them, and those will be checked, and the rest of code will be unchecked, but everything will be fine. So you, you can add annotations step by step and, and grow as you need it. You don't need to, to get to 100% coverage because this kind of information is more useful in one place than, than another, and, and sometimes for very dynamic Python code, Actually, most of the Python code we write is quite static and simple and, and follow types rules. But there, there is, every large project has some bits and pieces of code which uses some dynamic tricks. And it's fine to leave this, those unannotated because it's very hard to describe those kind of tricks to the, to the type checker. And, and it's no problem. It, you just use this when it's useful. So, you have all of this, and you have this in a separate tool. These annotations do not have any runtime effect at all. Yes, uh, you add the annotations, 
and you run the C Python interpreter, and the Python runs exactly as, the as if the annotations weren't there. Not exactly, exactly, there are, uh, the, the actual annotations are stored in a Thunder annotations field somewhere else, like somewhat like a doc string, but again, it's not a, an important effect. So uh, I won't go very deeply in an example, but you can see a function written twice, once without annotations and once with. And if you do things right, uh, both will type check and the second one, uh, both will type check, but the this first one, when actually executing it, will produce an error. And the last of them, you, you may find that uh, produce some things that would run in standard Python, but the type checker flags as, as a possible error. So one important thing about this is when, when you don't have any annotations at all, uh, actually, uh, when you're talking about any kind of uh, Python object, it's equivalent to what uh, MyPy calls any. Any means a Python object, and we all know that we can grab a Python object and do anything with it and index it and try to call it as a function and try to access any attribute on them, and this is valid Python. It may raise an exception, but if the attribute is not present or, or whatever, but that's valid Python. And an a Python object that I can do anything with is called any in MyPy. And actually, any is a default uh, annotation for any an annotated thing. So this code is exactly equivalent to this, which looks like exactly the normal Python that you used to write. So the point is, uh, the type system allows existing Python code to be valid with this magic trick. Uh, of course, if you annotate everything as any, uh, you're not doing any type checking at all, and, and it tends to be contagious because you grab something which is an any and call it and access an attribute on, on that any object, and you get an any again, and you import a, a module that has no type annotation, so everything you get from that has type any. Uh, so you get more value, especially if the modules that you use are annotated. The problem is that most modules nowadays are not, uh, except for the standard Python standard library and a few third-party models. So the idea behind this is that people should be writing uh, what's called type shells, which are Python files with the different extensions, uh, which only have the type annotations, like the signatures for the functions and classes without the, without the function bodies. And I've been working in the uh, Shango type shells, so I've been covering a bit of the, the Shango code base to be able to uh, use this in my, in my Shango projects. Um, this is something, by the way, I'll be working on this on the sprints. If anybody wants to take a look and see how this works, uh, the type shells itself, you're welcome to, to come close and talk. Um, so being that this is Shango event, let me tell you a bit about what's available right now. I've been covering mostly the um, the, the view interface, essentially, so that's covered the resolver and generic views, requests and response objects, and everything that goes inside that, and minor suite and pieces. My, probably the next thing I'll be doing is uh, Shango shortcuts and mean very commonly used functions where it's easy to make uh, silly mistakes and, and you may want to, to detect. Um, so to show you how it looks very, very quickly, uh, I'm writing a Shango view which sometimes uh, produces a redirection, so I write something like this. Uh, this has no annotations at all, but, well, I, I, I forgot the, the return statement, as you might have seen or not. So, uh, actually, you'll find that uh, if I run this, Shango will produce an error because it has an explicit check for views, uh, random check for views returning none, because this is a very frequent mistake. And actually, when you, I started looking into Shango, I found that it's actually doing a, a lot of type checking inside. Uh, most of the improperly configured errors are type checking problems in your settings file or in a, in a model admin object or something like that. And there are a lot of tiny places where Shango is actually doing type checking or declaring type structures. Models and forms are, are actually 
sort of like type declarations. They also have other kind of semantics. But um, so this is actually very natural, a very natural fit for for Shango projects and the way that Shango works. So if you annotate this and run the type checker, you'll find that uh, while you, there's an error, Shango shortcuts are, are still not covered, but uh, there's, a, there's a missing uh, return statement in my, in my function. So that's a very quick view. As, as I mentioned, I'm not going deeply into the details, but I'm willing to, to talk about this. Also, if you need uh, help or want to discuss how to add annotations into your Shango related projects, I would love to talk about it. I'll be in the conferences un until, until Friday. So before, before closing up, um, I wanted to mention a few possible problems or occasions where you may uh, find this uh, a bit difficult or, or not, not as valuable. I mentioned before that if your code is too dynamic and uses a lot of uh, tricks like uh, giving, for example, the query set code inside Shango, where double underscore means a follow a relationship which has types declared on a model. So probably type checking that, it's uh, essentially impossible or a nightmare. You should add specific extensions to a tool or something like that to, to be able to do that. So you probably won't have type checking in, in that places, and, and it's fine. You, you don't need to type check everything. Um, there are some uses of, of that, that, that typing that are supported, uh, and that support is improving uh, in, inside the tool. That's something that's a bit of, of a work in progress. The most popular uh, protocols in Python, like e iterators and context, context managers and stuff like that, work right out of, the, out of the box. But if you make your own protocols or do something a bit more different, uh, you may need to add a superclass or refactor your code or decide not that it's not worth the trouble and, and, not, and not use it for that part of the code again. Um, you, you can use unsupported libraries. That most of the libraries nowadays are unsupported. And uh, you'll get something that's roughly useful, but not as useful as if you had annotations everywhere, or mostly everywhere. And one option to do that is uh, you can add your own annotations, but uh, if you're not working with the, with the people on the upstream team, your annotations may be uh, outdated and, and that may be a problem. That's actually something that also I'm trying to, to figure out how to do. Uh, uh, tracking uh, with, this, with my type shells, all the changes in Shango and new versions and how to distribute that is, is one of the biggest problems that have to be solved yet. Um, so the, the tool itself, the, the checker, is quite good. It's usable. It's pretty fast. It's usable in, in continuous integration context. Um, there are some Raphael sheets that you can read about. That, that's actually a blog post I, I wrote when I started using this uh, about nine months ago. Uh, many of the problems I mentioned here are, are already fixed, so I, I should write an update. But it's uh, it's actually working pre pretty well, and I, I, I consider it a, a mature tool, but with a few references, but already usable. So, going back as, as in summary, uh, there are many good reasons to use it. Uh, for me, the main one is uh, readability. Uh, it's easier to refactor code and read code and read code uh, written by others and collaborate with code. So uh, my experience using this is that it forces you to, to avoid some, some bad decisions and some things that uh, you say, this is hard to, to describe to the type checker. Maybe a very dynamic use of Python that, that the type checker doesn't understand, and that's fine. But in many cases, it, it means that I'm making something more complicated than it should be. And in, in that sense, it's, it's a very useful uh, companion to my work as a developer. Um, and yes, you, you, can, you can try it. You can try it in a small piece of your code if, if you are not sure. It's not something that you have to take a big risk and, and dive into. Um, so your benefit might depend on what libraries are using and what kind of structure your code has. 
but I, I think you should probably give it a try. So that's all for my talk. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them, and I'll be happy to answer them on Slack or later on the conference. So thank you very much. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, any question? Please come to the microphone. Please speak slowly. <laughs> Russell first. I'm not an English speaker. <laughs> I'll be gentle. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, it, it occurs to me that um, there might be a possibility to do some of this stuff in reverse. So you talk about, for example, you've got a function that takes a file-like object. That's effectively your duct typing convention to say it must be able to be read and reset and yada, yada, yada. Um, has anyone looked at the possibility of looking at the code and working out on the basis of what methods are being invoked what the annotation should be or what the type could be that the variable going in should be? The, there is a, uh, there's also a type checker based on, on PEP44 built by the people at Google, which is, I forgot the name, mm -hmm. but I, I can look it up, uh, which actually does uh, inference for everything and uh, offers you this kind of suggestion so it allows you to do automatically. Uh, there are some, some scenarios where what you get there is not exactly what you might want. For example, uh, you may have a function that returns a list, a, a list in your implementation, but actually you know that you may have alternate implementations in the future, so you actually want to declare that it, it returns an iterable instead. Sure. So there, there are a bit of rough edges, but in general you, you can get some information. And, and you can even, uh, there are tools that you can use that you can run your program and see what the actual type of the thing is and use that for an annotation without analyzing the code. Sure. Okay. Thanks very much. Hello, me again. Uh, quick question about uh, looking for examples of this. Is there a existing Django project that you'd point people to if they want to look at how this works or a good example to learn from? Uh, I've only, uh, the only public project that I have using this is an implementation of the Shango tutorial project, so a very simple application. Uh, I'm not sure I have, have uploaded it yet. Uh, if I haven't, I can because I have it here. Uh, so I'll do that. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Check the repo because it may be already there. I, I, I don't remember. <laughs> um, you mentioned improperly configured in Django and the type checks that come along with it. Um, in my experience, the most Error, uh, the most common error there is the difference between having a tuple with one element and a string, which is what we quite often check for because it's an iterable and breaks. Yes. Uh, can type hinting in that sense help there at all? Or, I mean, y if you say you get an iterable, it would allow a string again. So how would you annotate in this specific case where you want a tuple or something useful, but surely not a string? Well, I, I actually, if, if the annotation for that field is declared as a tuple of strings, and you pass a string to that, uh, you actually get um, a, a type error. You, you can even declare it, it's a sequence of strings to allow tuples and lists, but not, uh, but not a string by itself. I'm not sure if a string is a sequence of strings, that may be a problem, but you can say a, a union of tuples and lists, or more complicated types. Actually, the, the type system itself is is quite uh, rich and allows you to describe very complicated data structures, so or, or variant of data structures. Any more question? Okay. okay. Thank you, Danielle, for speaking. Thank you. And this is. <laughs>